everyone. Welcome to the next episode of Bones and Stones. Today we have Peter Mitchell joining us from Oxford in the UK. Peter, thanks very much for, for joining us on this chat and we really look forward to hearing what, looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Um, I know the two Matts are going to want to ask you how you survived supervising me during my PhD. But just so everyone knows, I'm not sure Peter is ready to talk about that just yet. So we should avoid that question or anything related to it. Okay. <laughs> what, what, what's the phrase? What, what happens in Fight Club stays in Fight Club. <laughs> so talk about it outside. <laughs> well, um, none, nonetheless, we, we send our condolences to you. And some, <laughs> some roses will be arriving shortly. <laughs> Um, so to, to kick things off, um, Peter, could you, you've done so much work in Lesotho over the years in South Africa. Could you just chat to tell us a little bit about how you got into this part of the world and how you started working here? Totally by accident, which I think is actually probably true of most of people, certainly most of the people that I know of working in the UK in various parts of Africa. Um, so I was an undergraduate at Cambridge and at the time in Cambridge, you had to make a decision for the second and third years of your degree to specialize in a particular period or a particular part of the world. And I chose the later prehistory of Europe. So the Neolithic, the Bronze Age and the Iron Age. And um, that was great. I had people like Ian Hodder teaching me, for example, um, and John Alexander, who of course worked in Sudan uh, as well. So there was a little bit of Africanness there. At the time, we didn't have to do dissertations. Um, you could either choose to do a dissertation or you could choose to take an extra optional subject in your last year. So I had the offer of a particular dissertation topic get, um, made to me, um, a project that needed to be done. And I thought, that's great. Okay, that's, that's interesting. And I, I tried to get into it. And obviously, there was, you know, I, I just couldn't make it work. I, I couldn't really find a handle for it. So I was going out to David Phillipson's lectures on African archeology span purely out of interest, thinking that maybe there just might be some sort of comparative relevance to knowing about the, the last 10,000 years of African history to in, get, a, get a different view of the Neolithic Bronze Age and Iron Age in Europe. And he happened to say, you know, if any of you, and this meant me and the other guy in the room, that was just, that just the two of us, if any of you would like to do um, the Lady Prehistory of Africa as, as your final year option, come and see me. And I thought, that's wonderful. You know, there's my get out clause, the dissertation I can't do anything with. So I went off to his office and, um, and signed up and, and, and got really interested. At the end of that term, since the end of Michaelmas in, in, in December, you know, you go and see your college tutor and have a chat about how how things are going on and and he said to me are you um thinking of doing graduate work and i said well no not really the reason for that was that at the time cambridge was very much riven and i mean that literally because we had ian hodder on the one hand with many of his graduate students pushing post-processual archaeology and we had colin people like colin renfrew and jeff bailey who that particular term had given a course entitled Against Anarchy. And it was pretty clear who they had in mind. <laughs> and I was in this kind of haze about, you know, what, what, what the hell is the point of archaeology? You know, what, what, what can you do? What can you say? And, and I, so I, I was going to go off and plague the world of banking or the civil service or something equally <laughs> crazy. And my tutor lunged at me, across, literally lunged at me across his desk and said, well, I think you really should think about applying for graduate study. So I thought, okay, um, maybe I should. Um, this African thing is kind of interesting. So let me have a look, see what, um, what options exist in the UK. And the one thing I knew was that I didn't want to do just a one year master's course uh, because I figured if I embarked on a one year course, I would immediately have to start thinking about what I wanted to do and I wasn't sure. So I thought if I can do a two year master's course, then that gives me some breathing space and an opportunity to learn and to, and to reflect. And the only place that did that was Oxford. So I applied here, got a place. And of course, as you all know, Ray Inskeep, um, someone with very strong South African, Southern African connections, was the Africanist archeologist in Oxford at the time. And behind my back, he got into a conversation with Pat Carter at Cambridge, whom I had never come into contact in three years as an undergraduate. Um, I don't even know that I'd ever seen him, certainly never been taught by him. 
And they concocted a plan whereby an appropriate topic for a master's thesis would be um, for me to work on some of Pat's material from his excavations in Lesotho in the 1970s. And so it seemed to me like an interesting thing to do. And uh, so I said, yeah, that's fine. Um, and then given the nature of the funding and the nature of the system that, 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 that operated at that time here, um, it didn't turn out to be necessary to actually do a master's degree at all. So I junked the master's after a couple of months and signed up immediately for a doctorate. And the project just grew because there was, and there still remains a, a, an almost endless amount of material in Cambridge that Pat Carter dug that, that has still not been properly analyzed. And so the site that we, or the site that Ray and Pat had come up with was, was Hong Kong and particularly the Roberg, you know, the, the, the late Pleistocene, early microlithic assemblage that Pat had excavated there and that went very nicely with what was happening in Southern Africa at the time because this was 1983 and so it was just after Jeanette Deacon had finished her own PhD uh, in which of course the, the Roberg material from Wurmplas and Nelson Bay Cave in Kankara played an important part and she was asking questions about the relationship of technological change to climate change and so on. And just before her BAR came out at the latest stone age of Southern, Southernmost Africa the following year. So that was, that was the start. And I guess in a sense, I've never looked back. And, you know, I went to Southern Africa in 1985, went up to Lesotho for the first time then, which was quite an experience. And ultimately then started digging there. And to, Pat was a very interesting individual i think i'm very happy that he didn't teach me i think that would have been terrifying <laughs> but he was also a yeah, man of great integrity and honesty and, and 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 of considerable courage in going off to dig in the middle of the maluti mountains in yeah. the late 60s 1970s <laughs> and just before he retired he actually had me over to lunch in his college in cambridge and he was asking me after we after we were drinking coffee he said look don't pretend I didn't tell you this. If you'd done something sensible, like study the Neolithic of Wessex in Southern England, you'd have had a job by now. <laughs> and, and so I let that kind of hang for like 20, 30 seconds. And I said, yeah, that might be true, but it wouldn't have been as much fun. No, that's true. <laughs> which was actually the right answer to give to him as an individual. But I think it's also very much true because it has been an enormous amount of with one or two minor exceptions, it has been an enormous amount of fun actually getting involved in Southern African archaeology and being able to work in Lesotho. And so, you know, it, it's really a result of the two of them and their connection with each okay. other that, that, that it all happened. Yeah. Yeah, it's, fa it's fascinating hearing your story of in entering Lesotho. And, and from that, the amount of work that you've done there is, is spectacular. I mean, there's a huge range of studies you've put together, sites you've excavated. And the one that, you know, I think I, I was very lucky enough to visit it not that long ago was, was Sahong Hong. We didn't get to Medikani, unfortunately. We want, we planned to, but it's it's quite a drive after that. And it really had taken us, I think, five hours to get to Sahong Hong. So and we still had to get home. So but that's that's an, a, a remarkable site from its sequence as well as its history with uh thing interpreting a rock art panel to open. Just for the sake of some of the listeners and viewers who aren't as familiar with Sahong Hong, what are the, the major key points about the site that are of significance? I think. One of the things, obviously, as you just said, is that, is that along with Medikani, which is um, a few tens of kilometers further south, it has the longest and most comprehensive sequence of any site, uh, certainly in the, in the Maluti Drakensberg Mountains and, and pretty much in Lesotho as a whole. Um, so it starts, off, uh, starts out in life around about 60,000 years ago, um, um, maybe the tail end of the Howison's Port. It has a whole series of occupations that Brian Stewart is now digging through marine ice dope stage three. Uh, and then it has the material on top from the latest Stone Age, which is what I excavated. Um, and Pat, of course, went from top right the way down to, to bedrock back in 1971. So one of the things is, 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 is that it's got this very long sequence. Um, and one of the particular interests that I had in going back there in 1992 when I was working in Cape Town was the fact that it is unusual in that it has occupation before, at, 
and in the coming out of the last glacial maximum. So it's a, a, a window into what people are doing in what is a quite high elevation place okay. at a period of much colder temperatures. Plus, that is within a meter, a meter 10, meter 20 at most of the modern surface. Okay. So it's not like many other sites like Wurmplas where you'd have to dig down a lot, lot further to get to that late Pleistocene mm -hmm. material. It's relelatively accessible. And then of course, there's the rock art. There's the fact that it's one of the very few sites, one of only three sites where you have a Bushman saying that mm -hmm. painting means that. And mm -hmm. it's important locally in terms of its historical yeah. setting. Lots of other things too, but those yeah. would be the main. Yeah, yeah. I mean, standing at knowing knowing the story of Joseph Alpin and King and the and the significance of that interpretation, and then visiting the site and being able to see what's left of that panel. It, it's knowing that story. It's quite a quite a moment to stand there and see that all. Uh, it is, but you know where it is. Yeah. If yeah, it, in fact, it was Nadira Tabile who had to. I searched for it, and eventually he called me and said, "Let me help you. You can stop looking. It's over here." So if it wasn't, so, I think I would have found it. Uh, 1985, when I went up there with Taulita Sele, uh, so that he could take photographs for Lucas Smith's rock art project. I don't remember, I must have seen it, but I don't remember seeing it. I don't remember identifying it. Okay. I almost knew what it looked like. So we were, we were digging there and camping in the site in 1992. We went round all the rock shelter wall looking twice, still <laughs> couldn't find it. Third time, we got lucky. And I told Pat Carter about this and he said, yeah, but of course that's why I carved that huge X on the bedrock <laughs> immediately in front of it because that was the origin of his grid point <laughs> for, for planning the site. Of course that made sense, yeah. but only retrospectively. <laughs> yeah. uh, Matt, come on, I see you've got a question. <clears throat> yeah, thank you for the fascinating insight, Peter. This is really, uh, really quite an interesting story. Uh, and as you said before, we started the chat a bit, recalling a bit of your life history, which is which is interesting to hear. Um, so just to touch on the point about the, the sort of circumstances of being in Lesotho during the later Stone Age, during a period where it's extremely cold. I mean, it, it is probably one of the most variable environments uh, in South Africa. Um, in terms of, of weather changes and, um, you know, what, what are your opinions on why uh, people would have repeatedly returned to this particular landscape, uh, even to Sahong Hong, because this sort of transition from Middle Stone Age to later Stone Age, uh, it seems like this was a, a place of repeated occupation over a very long, uh, you know, sort of portion of time. So what, what would have been the attraction to this place, in your opinion? I think Sahong Hong specifically, is because there are very few really larger rock shelters in that area. And it is, as, as Tim will confirm, very, very big. I think it's probably the biggest rock shelter in the, likely in the, in the whole of the Eastern side of Lesotho, certainly the biggest that I've ever seen. Um, and it's actually quite comfortable, um, you know, having lived in it for over two months. Um, it faces due west, it gets a lot of sunshine in the latter part of the day. It's pretty well protected. Um, but more generally, of course, what you're thinking about is, you know, wh wh why on earth are people going to 1800 meters above sea level in the middle of a set of mountains at a time when temperatures on average may have been five, six degrees less than today? So I, I think two things. I think one, I, in my view, we need to understand that they're probably there very episodically and very opportunistically. It's not that they're, they're camping out there for thousands of years necessarily as a block they're probably taking advantage of particular situations, particular moments, maybe moments when things are actually rather more favorable than they are either side. But the consequence of what we see is then a buildup over a longish period of time. And then I think the other thing which Brian, Brian Stewart has talked about, which I think makes sense to me, is that this is one of the wettest parts of Southern Africa. Uh, if you compare it to pretty much everywhere to the west um, because it's high up and because we have reason to think that in very broad terms climate would have been similar to what it is today in terms of summer and winter rainfall zones and so on you would have been having you would have been getting pretty reliable rainfall I would think up there you combine that with a, a lot of um, topographic diversity because the terrain is obviously doing this and I think you've probably got a fair amount of ecological variety. And I think you put those three things together, it's an attractive place for people to be 
from time to time. And certainly in relation to areas in the interior, in the Free State, the Karoo, and elsewhere, across much of the rest of Southern Africa. What struck me from Sahong Hong and in some of the sites um, as well that was, were being excavated in the Podihadi area, is, is some of the sort of, you know, foreign artifacts that are coming up there from like Kona shells from the coastline, uh, vervet monkey remains, uh, ostrich eggshell. And I thought that was quite interesting because if you're looking at some form of seasonality or mo people moving in and out at certain times or impulses, they're bringing with them some particularly valuable stuff. Do you think that that's sort of suggestive of, of the intentions and the goals of going to some of these sites, bringing these valuable items like Kona shells with them for ritual purposes? Because I'd imagine if it's hunting forays or short trips, you wouldn't necessarily have to bring all that kind of stuff with you. I and mean, we, we even found glass beads up there. Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting because everyone thinks about um, seasonal mobility, mostly in the context of the Parkington Sealy debate in the Western Cape. And aggregation dispersal, quite rightly, people think of Lynn Wadley's work because that was a major theme of her PhD uh, around Jubilee Shelter in Cape James. But actually, if you look back in the literature, Pat kind of got that and put the two things together no, back really. in 1970 when he was writing a paper which was utterly theoretical because he had no empirical evidence at all from the archaeological record, suggesting that people would have been moving up into the, so he was thinking of this from a KwaZulu-Natal side, but up into the mountains in summer because that's when it's warmer, you get more access to fish, more access to game, more access to plant foods. But also that that would be the season of the year at which you would be able to have people coming together in larger numbers and therefore aggregating together and that, that might therefore be a more propitious context for ritual, for ceremony and for rock art. Mm -hmm. So in a way he was kind of foreshadowing the aggreg aggregation dispersal idea there and I think it might be that that's partly what you're seeing with this focus on items of exchange mm. or, or items that connote um, long distance connections of some kind in, in wh wh when you're when you're talking of the kinds of items that you just mentioned yeah thanks uh, thanks very much uh, Peter I mean this this is incredibly interesting I mean if I could just say um, you know, what utmost respect I have for you for having done so much work in Lesotho with, with my limited experience, having worked with uh, Tim up in the, uh, you know, Porihadi Mohutlong area. It really is um, an extreme place to work. Um, you know, one, well, one when you have electric blankets like he did, but uh... <laughs> yeah. that was for my child. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. Actually, we were uh, camping. <laughs> yeah. But uh, Peter, just a, a question. Um, you know, obviously, so Hong Hong, you know, it's, it's an incredible site. Uh, you mentioned the uh, the fact that the deposits straddle uh, both pre and post the LGM. Um, and obviously, there's favorable uh, preservation of organic material, yes. uh, paleobotanical remains, faunal remains. What kind of trends do we see, um, you know, trends in kind of human behavioral patterns pre and post the LGM uh, within the deposits? So I think one of the things that's interesting that that um, Brian and I have written about, for example, is that there seems to be a, some evidence of um, maybe an intensification of use of fish uh, in some of those late Pleistocene deposits, um, which we suggest might have been an attractive resource from the point of view of both protein and fat, if people are intercepting them as they're, as they're moving up the, the orange, they're moving up the senku um, in, in spring, summer to spawn. Um, and that there's some hints from the, from the uh, ecological literature that in fact some of these species may actually have been more, um, might have been more abundant if the water temperature was a little bit cooler than it is today. So I think that's an interesting uh, thing to see. And it's interesting to see that at Dikwayeng, which is about uh, maybe maybe two to three kilometers away on the opposite side of the, of the oranges is an open air site that I dug later on. Um, most of the occupation of that site falls within the neoglacial. So that's obviously not as cold as the last glacial maximum, but on the other hand, it is definitely cooler. Mm -hmm. And the one, one of the clear things that people went to that particular place to do was to catch fish. Because I think Ina Plach estimated that there might be out of the area we dug which is a fraction of what survives, which is a fraction of what was once there. 
out of what we dug, she estimated we got maybe one and a half million bits of fish bone. Yeah. Wow. Uh, yes. I think I think I think the NISP count is sixty one thousand and something. Oh my, that's amazing. <laughs> if, if I could just follow up quickly, just with regards to the fish bones, um, you mentioned the the seasonality aspect in terms of them potentially going to the area during the spring and summer when the fish yeah. are spawning. So how is that reflected in the actual fish bones themselves? Are we looking at a higher distribution of, of smaller, you know, jaws and teeth and stuff like that? Or what exactly reflects that seasonality? From, so from Ina's analysis, and, and she, she looked at the fish both at Hong Kong and De Kuyang from my excavations. Yes, you can find some individuals who are smaller, which would be consistent with saying something maybe about seasonality. But the assumption of when people are up there is mostly based on the ecological literature, i.e. that we know that the species concern, like um, Labiobarbus, like uh, uh, Barbus, they're species which are going to move upstream to spawn in spring, early summer. And they, they, do, they didn't necessarily all do it at the same time. There's a kind of staggered process with one taxon and then the next species. Um, but at that season, we, we thought maybe at De Kuyeng that we could get something out of otoliths, but um, looking into that more in more detail, um, we figured it wasn't really going to be something that was going to uh, be reliable enough in our particular case. So, so it's, it's essentially based on the ecology of the, of the fish themselves. All right. Well, thank you very much, Peter. Um, now, I, I'm going to have to ask you this question because it is a requisite for being on this uh, this show for something for myself and, and Lauder uh, to find interest in. Are there, in your opinion, many um, uh, significant earlier Stone Age sites in, in Lesotho? Um, there's been a lot of work in East Africa going on right now with the Ashulian and the Highlands. It is a very interesting um, sort of... Um, record that's being established about people who don't come with the sort of preconceptions about, you know, you know, the, the sort of modern ability to adapt to different environments. Obviously, these, these people had a lot less on their uh, sort of technological record and, and what they were working with. And yet we find them in these, these sort of very extreme environments, uh, particularly the Ashulian uh, sort of people. So, uh, you know, what, do you find Ashulian up there? Do you find sort of earlier Stone Age? And, and what is your, your sort of thoughts around that? I'm going to disappoint you both. Um, Pat found, I think, four, maybe Shirlian slash four Smith um, cleavers come hand axes. I mean, they're fairly fairly poorly defined. All of them are surface finds in and around Hong Kong. I recollect finding one more. So to the best of my knowledge, that's it. Okay. No, one, no, no one's found any okay. other ESA material anywhere in the country, which is interesting because obviously you get stuff up in Ethiopia at, at a not dissimilar kind of altitude, if not more. So, yeah. of course, Southern Africa, it's going to be cooler. Um, and I think also the other thing is that one's always got to think that, you know, people have got choices. They, it's not that they have to go to Lesotho. Mm -hmm. They, 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 they can make a, a call and say, well, no, actually, it's much better being somewhere else. We know it's there, but we're not going to worry about it. But I think otherwise, as far as we know, the, the oldest evidence we've got of people being up there and being up there then more or less continuously, as it were, is I think the basal date Brian got from Medicani is about 80 something thousand years. Okay. So, so well into the Middle Stone Age. Mm. But go work there. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you'll oh, find something matt you can do lots you can do some fishing there's lots of fish clearly in the area um <laughs> now we now we've established the correct seasons as well spring and summer thanks i know when to go there <laughs> no 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 Win winter is by far the best time to be there okay. <laughs> like, in, in, terms of, in terms of doing field work it's by far the best time because it's dry yeah uh, it's way easier so Peter, just to sort of uh, wrap up a little bit, uh, in next year we have a SA our SAPA conference in Lesotho and it's the first time it's happening in Lesotho and I think a lot of people are quite excited about that as well. Um, you've, you've written about uh, you know, developing infrastructure within Lesotho around heritage management and around heritage in, in general. And, and obviously I think the hope with this conference in Lesotho is that it, it in part stimulates some of that as well and that there's a growing heritage field within the country. 
Um, from your Met Long project as well, which is for those who aren't listening, is uh, sorry, who aren't familiar, um, Met Long was another, <laughs> maybe they aren't listening either, I'm not sure, but uh, Met Long is another dam that Peter did a big mitigation project on with Charlie Arthur and several others um, before the valley was flooded, excavating a number of sites and working on a bunch of rock art sites as well. Um, from your work there and your other work in, in the country, what do you think are really important developmental steps that, that can be taken to develop infrastructure, to grow the field within Lesotho, to maybe even, you know, better relations with South African archaeologists and do, do transnational projects and so on? Well, okay, that's a lot of things. Um, firstly, transnational projects. I think, I think that would be great because um, from an archaeological point of view, obviously the, the national boundaries that exist in Southern Africa at the moment are, are, are irrelevant. Um, however much they may constrain and, and have influenced the development of the subject and its infrastructure. Um, I think that that needs to be done, however, on a basis of mutual respect and understanding. And, and your work and Len, Len's work at the Potty Hadi Dam are examples of that. But I, I know of people from South African institutions who have worked in Lesotho, and I don't necessarily only mean under apartheid, um, and who have done that without any research permission whatsoever. Um, so I think it needs to be on that kind of basis of mutual respect. Yeah. Um, I think that um, it would be great if the ASAPA conference can take place as a real conference in, in, the, in the normal understanding of that term after the last year or so. And I think if it can raise the profile of archaeology and heritage within Lesotho as a mm -hmm. whole, for government, for people working in the relevant ministries, for politicians, uh, maybe in the university as well, that will be enormously important. I think that what Charlie was able to do is demonstrate the significance and the necessity of building archaeological skills from the bottom up. Uh, that's not necessarily the best way of putting it, but in the sense of there's a lot that one can do in situations like Lesotho where you don't necessarily have a great number of academically trained individuals, but you can nevertheless build up a, a body of people um, and equip them with the skills to make them extremely competent field archaeologists, as you know, personally. Yep. So, yeah. um, and I think that's maybe something that one could think of uh, developing more widely in some other situations in southern africa and i think that um in terms of heritage preservation one absolutely has to try and get local communities involved in that and empowered in that because there is no other way in which mm -hmm. for example rock art in lesotho is going to have any chance of surviving there are some very good instances. I mean, I've seen some very good instances where local chiefs or local communities have made a, their own individual efforts in that regard. But I've also seen instances where that hasn't happened and it, and it needs to have government backup. And I think Lesotho is not going to have masses of, of opportunity for tourism. You know, hmm. people are not going to go thousands of kilometers to hike in the Drakensberg if they can go to Kruger. Sure, yeah. But you can tack on a degree of tourism in Lesotho or you can build tourism for a local Southern African base. And I think where that can, as with pony trekking, um, put money directly into the pockets of people in local communities, then you have a way of, in a sense, marketing things like rock art or marketing other heritage sites in a way that will ensure that they are a tangible benefit mm -hmm. to local people. And that you need to get that buy-in, like you do in wildlife conservation. Yeah. Um, so all those things. Yeah. It'd be nice if we can make some moves on those. Yeah, and I mean tourism is a big one, and you know it's something that can be mobilised, you know, in many parts of the country, and and will hopefully have some benefits. There's enough people coming up places like Sani Pass and visiting Kutsi from South Africa as well, where at least in those those areas there can be decent tourism potential, or there is decent tourism potential, but it's harnessing that and. Converting it into something tangible is, is, is another matter. But Peter, thank you very much for joining us. This has actually been, a re I'd love to continue talking. It's been fascinating, um, but uh, we really do appreciate it. Um, 
I won't show you the, the views outside my window and the, the sunshine and the warmth and the green leaves and stuff, but it is there. <laughs> but we do really appreciate it. And uh, best of luck with the next few months and teaching and every, all the university responsibilities during a time of COVID, which I think we can all agree is particularly challenging. Um, but thank you. Yeah, it's been a no, great chat. Thank you all very much. And uh, let's hope that um, at least next year, we can all get together yeah. both in, and, and, and uh, the two of you in particular, Matt and Matt can also get to see a lot of Lesotho on the ground. Cause I think yeah. that would be a really important and, and, and attractive part of the conference as a whole to actually go out and see the country. It's yeah. a great place. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thank, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. Cheers.